morning, church. So, so good. Thank you. Appreciate that, Bob. It's morning. We'll try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, I don't know whether to leave response time, response for that or not. But so good to see you all this morning and get to worship together. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6 as we continue in our series this morning. Uh, our series has been called What We Do, and it is built on who we are in Christ as the transforming power of Christ uh, begins to make us and continues to make us more and more like Jesus, then we live that out in what we do. And so this morning in chapter 6, you get to this 10th verse, and we'll read it in just a moment together, but it begins with this word, finally. And so Paul begins, or really begins the ending, if I, will, if I can, of this letter with this word, finally. And so these are kind of these last words as he's writing to this church in Ephesus. And as we know, sometimes last words can be so important. And imagine the thought that would have gone through, what do I want to say to this church that was so dear to him? He spent over three years of his life building and pouring in the scripture and raising up leaders and all of that in this church in Ephesus. What are these final things that I want to challenge and encourage them with? And so with that in mind, would you stand with me if you're physically able in honor of reading God's word? Chapter 6, we're going to read 10 through 13 this morning. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, In the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Father, would you bless these words? God, drive them into our hearts that we may be transformed by your spirit to look more and more like Jesus. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And if I can remind us, remember this this city in Ephesus, this bustling, really metropolis of its time, one of the the largest cities in Asia Minor, really kind of this capital city, and trade would come through it from the ports and from land, and you would have, uh, so, so all of this commerce, and not only commerce, but you would have cultures colliding, and this church is being built up in the midst of this, facing persecution from really day one, in Ephesus when they began to plant the church as they marched these new believers into uh, really what was a theater at that time and cried Artemis, 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 which was the God of the city because these Christians, these Christ followers were disrupting their economy. They were disrupting their way of life and their way of worship. And so from the very beginning, there's there's been persecution, there's been conflict. And so Paul is writing to this church And I think these last words as he began, he encourages them to be strong. And I love that phrase that he uses, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. It kind of has this Old Testament connotation or this, the vernacular, the way it's said and structured that this idea of remember who the Lord is and the strength that is found in who he is. And I think it's good for us to begin that way today as we look at this is that remembrance. Who is our God? Because he is a strong God and that we would know the strength of him. One of the first ways we see that, and by the way, if you have your notes, you can kind of follow along with this. It may be helpful in your worship guide. But one of the first ways we see to be strong in the Lord and to know the strength of our God is that the Lord is a warrior, as the scripture calls him. Psalm 24, 8 puts it this way, Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. And this psalm is the same one. We talked about it once before in here where uh, it follows in those verses and says, Lift up your head, O gates, that the King of glory may come in. And it's this reminder That in those times when you were to build a temple to a God, you would build it with larger gates or bigger gates as big as you could because what it would portray to the people in that society is this is how big this God is. And so when you hear these words from the psalmist, lift up your heads, O gates, for the king of glory may come in, it's basically saying there is no gate large enough for the one true God. 
that the king of glory may come in, that his strength is made known in that psalm, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And we see it over and over again, the strong hand of the Lord, even as as God delivers them from Egypt, as he defeats Pharaoh, as he defeats the Egyptians through the 10 plagues, and, and literally the last one being this Passover, the last one being the death of the firstborn and how God passes over and it begins the celebration and God tells them uh, to celebrate year after year remembering uh, the strong hand of the Lord. Here's what it says in Exodus 13, 9, and it shall be to you a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. And he's also a warrior when he been, begins to bring them into the promised land. And you see as Joshua marches across following the words of God and he leads them to Jericho and God fights for them from the first battle. And then really through the next seven chapters in Joshua, we see fight after fight, even as the nations there rise up and, be, and, and, and rally together five at a time or seven at a time. And they stand up to the, to the, to the armies essentially of Israel and yet every time God goes before them and gives the land into their hands. Over and over and over again, God fights for his people. The Lord is a warrior. Not only in Joshua, if you were to follow it, even to the judges, the next part of it, the people who become part of this cycle of sin is what it's called in the judges. So uh, they essentially get comfortable and begin sinning against God and walking in the ways of the people that they, shouldn't have, that they have already defeated, that they shouldn't be walking. And as their sin would happen, God uh, would bring them into a place where he would draw them back to himself uh, through suffering, through struggle. And so they would finally cry out to God, and God would raise a judge. And there were so many judges, time and again, that we can read the stories where God begins to deliver and deliver. There's one specifically I'll mention today, Gideon, a guy who was not necessarily a leader at all, and yet God raises his, him up. And as The nations around them are building a massive army to come against him. God whittles Gideon's army down to 300 and defeats them in the midst, in their midst. And when they finally walk out into the battlefield, they're gone, they're done. God has fought for them because the Lord is a warrior. Joshua and Judges, we see it with kings. King David, who at this point isn't even a king yet, he's a young man who goes and delivers sandwiches to his brothers who are standing on the front lines as they're all waiting and watching to see if anyone is going to stand up to this giant named Goliath who's in the valley. And as David walks up carrying his food, delivers it, and he looks at him and says, who is this who dares defy the army of the living God? And he walks out of there with five stones. He only needed one. And through the strength of the Lord fells Goliath, and the battle is won. David eventually becomes king, and the territory would expand as he's obedient to the Lord as God fights for his people. Not only in David, we see it down the road when the Assyrians are coming after the Israelites, and King Hezekiah, who is righteous before the Lord, is now king, and as they've sacked other cities, they're marching on Jerusalem, and Sennacherib, the, uh, the king, sends one of his guys to come and basically utter threats over the wall and try to discourage and dissuade the people from fighting, and Hezekiah spreads it out before the Lord, is what the scripture says, and God fights for them, sends the Assyrians away, never again to bother the Israelites. As a matter of fact, they're defeated by the Babylonians and God preserves his city and preserves his people. The Lord fights. He's a warrior. We see it there. We see it in the prophets. We see it all through the scripture over and over and over again. And here's the encouragement. That as we begin to remember that the Lord is a warrior, it gives us strength just as it did the Ephesians, that no matter what we're going through, no matter what we face, no matter what struggle, what issue, what challenge comes against us, that our God is a warrior who fights for his glory and for his people. Not only is he a warrior, Proverbs 18.10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. He's not only a warrior, but he's a shelter and a refuge. And you can get this picture, this strong tower that is out there, and the righteous man runs into it and is safe. And and I love this picture because the righteous man is doing what is right. 
He's running to the shelter who is his God. And there are times in our lives when we absolutely need to be in that shelter and we don't necessarily fight in our own strength in any way, but we run to the shelter of God knowing that he will fight for us and we take refuge in him. And there is strength when we acknowledge that we are weak without him and his strength is what propels us forward. So we take refuge in God. He is our shelter. The same King David who stands up to Goliath multiple times in the next few years after that, before he's king, is fleeing from Saul. And we get some of the most amazing psalms written from his hand as he's running for his life, running to the shelter of his God, trusting God to preserve him in the midst of a man who's coming after his life with everything that he can. We see it not only there, but in stories like Daniel in the lion's den who stands up to the king and finds himself there in the protection of his God and the shelter of the only one who could protect him there. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Imagine just the picture in that moment. These guys thrown into the fiery furnace in Babylon as exiles in the land. The king in his anger throws them in, heats the furnace hotter than ever before. As a matter of fact, the guys who threw them in were consumed because it was so hot. And yet as they look inside and peer into this blazing furnace... They don't see just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but a fourth, as the scripture says, who has the appearance of an angel. And those guys walk out of there without even smelling like smoke. That is the strength of our God as a refuge and a strong tower that we run into. We see it in Elijah. We see it over and over in so many in the text. In this Psalm 61, 4 says it this way, let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. And the picture in the image is this massive bird. If you can imagine in our context, maybe like a California condor or something like that, that has a nine foot wingspan. In their context, it would have been the griffin vulture massive bird and when it flies overhead you see the shadow of it it would literally cover you for a moment as it flies over and that's the image this massive powerful god and we're under his wings sheltered from the storms of life sheltered from the things that would come because we serve a god who is a mighty warrior and a shelter and not only that but he is god alone there is no other there is no other. Moses says this of God as he's bringing them into the land. He says, oh, Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there on heaven or earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Going back to the story of Hezekiah when the Assyrians are coming, when Sennacherib is coming full force, here's the words of Hezekiah in that moment. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste to all the nations and all their lands, and they've cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from this hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are God. He is God alone, the mighty refuge a mighty warrior. And the fourth thing we understand about the strength of our God is that he is also the God who saves. In Ephesians, earlier in this letter, in chapter 1, verses 19, it says, Then what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? The immeasurable greatness of his power, his strength toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is to be named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. The greatest demonstration of the power of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it is the foretaste of our resurrection and it is the good news of the gospel. And the reality is this, the greatest demonstration of God's power is in the opportunity for the forgiveness of sin. That we, all of us, you and I, are sinners and we fall short of God's glory. Every one of us has sinned. And so what happens is we separate ourselves from a holy and just and a pure God. 
that God didn't leave us in our sin, but because of his great mercy and his love and the strong God that he is, sent Jesus Christ, his son, who lived a perfect life and literally became the substitute for us. We were destined to die for our sins and go into an eternity apart from God, and yet Jesus went to that cross. He took your sins and he took mine and he paid for them, becoming the death that we deserved, taking our sin upon himself and the wrath of God. And he died and was raised three days later in the power of the resurrection. And now he ascends at the right hand of the Father where he sits and intercedes on our behalf. And the good news is this. The message of the gospel is so simple. That for us to have that eternal life, for us to find life in Jesus and have our sins as they've been paid for, completely erased and removed from us because of Jesus, it's simply we say this, God, I know that I'm a sinner and that I've been separated from you because of my sin. But I repent. Repent means that you turn a 180. And if I believe in your mouth, or excuse me, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. And so God, I confess that I invite Jesus as my Lord and Savior into my life recognizing that I can't do it on my own. And you know what? When you believe and confess, the simplicity of what happens is literally the God of the universe, that mighty God, his Holy Spirit, comes to live inside of you. And the scripture says you are born again and made new to walk with him faithfully for the rest of your days. That eternal life begins now and it lasts forever. It's that simple. And yet it is the strong power of our God that enables it to happen. It's a reminder that we serve a strong God. And it says this, finally be strong in the Lord. So understanding then how the strength of our God is, how mighty he is, that we would be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And literally that could be translated, strengthen yourself in the Lord. And what I love about that is it doesn't say strengthen yourself, period. Because that's kind of the context of our world a lot of times, that I would pull myself up by my bootstraps, that I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make this work, that I'm going to be strong, that I'm going to be powerful, that I'm going to do all that I need to do to succeed in life. And it's not what it says. It says, be strong in the Lord. Strengthen yourself in Christ because it's in recognition that we are weak and he is strong that his strength is perfected in us and that we do incredible things for the glory of God and for his kingdom's sake because it is Christ working in and through us, not ourselves doing it. So we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. When do we do that? In distress, in fear and anxiety, no matter what we're going through, that we strengthen ourselves in the Lord, that we draw near in that way. David, through one of the stories in his life in 1 Samuel 30. Chapter 30, verse 6, it's in a down moment. Before he was king, he was leading this band of essentially mighty men is what the scripture calls them. And they got ransacked when they were away. uh, Another group had literally come in and kidnapped their families and all of that. And they're downtrodden. And here's what the scripture says. It says, and David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because of all the people were bitter in soul and for each for his sons and his daughters but David strengthened himself in the Lord. He didn't try to do it himself. He sought God, and he strengthened himself, and he was obedient, and they rescued, and God saved the day as he does. He fights for his people. In distress, we call out to God in fear and anxiety, not knowing what to do. When we're surrounded, Zechariah 10, 12, as they're going into exile, He gives them this promise, I will make them strong in the Lord and they shall walk in his name. That one day they'll be strong in the Lord in the midst of the exile and when they come home as the remnant that God will provide. Do you ever feel like you're surrounded? Nothing seems to be going right. Be strong in the Lord. Because even in the greatest moments of distress, We need God's strength when we're fulfilling his purposes. 
As God was marching his people in and Joshua became their leader, he tells them so many times in Joshua chapter 1 to be strong and courageous. 1-6, be strong and courageous. 1-7, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do to all the law, to do all of the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Joshua 1-9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua 1-18, only be strong and and courageous. Because so many times we feel stuck, we feel powerless, we feel out of control in life. Psalm 27, 13, and 14 puts it this way, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. There's a passage in Isaiah, we think about the strength of our God and how we draw near to him in the midst of it. In Isaiah 40, the book of Isaiah is written really to the northern kingdom before they're about to get sacked by the Assyrians. And Isaiah, so much of it is encouraging them to look forward to the coming Messiah who would come years and years later. But there's this moment of strength that he gives them. And really it's in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to 31. And here's the encouragement in the midst of them about to go into exile. Have you not known... Have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. Let me say this. Whatever you're going through, if there's a struggle you're facing right now, if there's an issue that you just can't seem to get past, would you hear these words? And apply it in your heart in that situation that you're walking through. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. The creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. Take strength in the God that does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint And to him who has no might, he increases strength. It says, even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall and be exhausted. But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That encouragement, that challenge to be strong as they're walking into that exile. And I love this, the rest of the story. So God's bringing them out of exile. Some have come with a guy named Zerubbabel and Ezra, and they've restored, and Zerubbabel, that's just a fun name to say, but Zerubbabel and Ezra, and they've come out, and they've restored the temple, and now this guy, Nehemiah, you've probably heard of him before if you've uh, been around church for any length of time, he comes and he leads this group to rebuild the wall, and they're astounded and amazed at how quickly the wall was rebuilt because of the favor of God on them, and so they gather at the temple to celebrate and to read these words of the law, and as they begin reading them, what happens is the people are so convicted that they begin weeping and mourning as they hear the words of the law read. And Joshua looks at the priest and essentially says, hey, this is a day of rejoicing, not mourning. This is a good thing. God, look what God has done and what he's restored. And here's what it says in Nehemiah chapter 8. Then he said to them, go your way. Eat fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Which means even in that moment, recognizing they've come home, that God is restoring as he said he would in the remnant for so long. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and now it's coming full force that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So how do we strengthen ourselves understanding all of that? Three simple things. First, we remember who our God is. We remember who our God is. How many times do we see in the scriptures where God 
has them set up some kind of memorial, some kind of remembrance, some kind of, uh, of altar, essentially, that says when your children walk by this way and ask, what do these stones mean? Then you'll tell them, this is where God parted the water so that we could cross over on dry ground, or this is where God did this, or this is where God did this, that we would remember the God we serve is strong, that he's mighty in battle, that he is a refuge and a strong tower, that he fights for his people, and that he is the God who is mighty to save we would remember. The second way we strengthen ourselves in the Lord is that we trust him and follow his ways. If he is that God and he is, then he is worthy to be trusted even when we don't understand, even when everyone around us is doing the opposite. We trust his ways and we follow him. And the third is this, that we choose to find joy in Christ even when our circumstances would say that doesn't make any sense. We choose to find joy in Christ because the joy of the Lord is our strength, which what does that mean? It means that when we choose to have joy, that God gives us strength and a heart of thankfulness, and it changes everything about even our present circumstance because we know the God whom we serve and has all things under his control. We remember the God we serve, we trust him and follow his ways, and we choose to find joy in Christ. Back in Ephesians, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. In verse 11, he says, put on the full armor or the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We'll get to that in just a minute. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There are some commentators who look at this verse and try to kind of uh, parse or outline some kind of... um, system of demon activity or different kind of tiers of levels and all that of these guys are here and these guys are here. I don't know that that's what that scripture is saying. I think what Paul is writing to them and is reminding them that there is a spiritual battle that's taking place that is unseen. And so there's a recognition that we have to have. We, we understand that we are strong in the Lord and that God is sovereign and there is no equal to him. And then we understand that there's a real battle that's being fought that we recognize the real battle. And he says this, for our battle is not against flesh and blood, which means we don't wrestle and we don't battle against people. Right, it's not that we look at others no matter how far down the path of sin they've gone and we hate those people and our battle is against them. We recognize our battle is against sin. And so when we see people who have gone down that far path, we know, but for the grace of God, go any of us. And so we love them back to Jesus the best we can. We reach out with loving arms and we serve as Christ would serve. And we draw them into relationships sharing the gospel because Jesus is the one who can free them. And there is no sin that is more powerful than the saving blood of Christ. And so we love for our battles, not against flesh and blood, but there is a battle. The spiritual world is a reality. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11 describes it this way. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is not meant to glorify our enemy, but in the recognition that there really is a real spiritual world and there is a real battle that takes place. Because I think one of the greatest things the enemy does in a scheme, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, to distract us from this is trying to get us to a place, especially in the Western world, where we don't even see that there is a spiritual world at all. Why does that matter? Because then we don't need to pray. Because we got it all under control. Then we don't need to do battle, if you will, with the armor of God that he proposes and we're going to learn more about next week. But there is a spiritual battle. There is an adversary who seeks to devour and to destroy. 2 Corinthians 4.4 puts it this way, describing the God of this world, which is the enemy. In this case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And Ephesians 2 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, that we have an enemy. 
and there's a battle to fight. Back in verse 11, it says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The schemes of the devil. So what does that look like? So if we're supposed to stand against these, how do we begin to identify what are the schemes of the devil? And generally, that would be anything that takes us off point, anything that takes our eyes off of Christ and our feet off of the mission that God has called us on is what the enemy does. And he's subtle and he's crafty and he's been around a long time and knows what he's doing. And so there's a reality that we have to understand that this battle is taking place and then there are schemes that are happening. And I think one of the first places we can turn to to begin to understand a little bit of what this looks like is when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness in Matthew 4, 1 through 10. I'm going to kind of paraphrase it, but I encourage you to go back at another time and read through it. Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 10. And so Jesus goes into the wilderness. He fasts for 40 days, the Judean wilderness and 40 nights. And the scripture, probably an understatement, but says, and he was hungry. Right, 40 days and 40 nights without food, you're hungry. He's fully God, fully man, and so experiences that same hunger that you and I would experience fasting 40 days and 40 nights. And then at that point, the enemy comes to tempt him. And so the first temptation that Jesus encounters is that Satan looks at him and says, hey, why don't you just make these stones into bread? You seem hungry. Just make them into bread. You've got the authority and the power. Why can't you just do that and go ahead and eat and then things will be good? You know what Jesus responds with? Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So what is he saying? Because Jesus quotes what is Deuteronomy 8, which is the people as they're wandering in the desert and God provides manna for them. And even in the provision of that manna, God was saying, it's not about the manna, it's about obedience to me, and I will provide for your every need. And so that first temptation is this, God can't meet your needs. The Father's not going to take care of you. You're hungry. Just do it yourself. How many of us face that same temptation? I'm tired of waiting on the Lord. I'm just going to take this into my own hands. I'm going to take care of things myself. God, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pray about this uh, major decision that we're going to go through. I'm not going to worry about this because I don't know what you're going to say. I don't know if it's going to be the right thing. So I'm just going to take things into my own hands and provide for myself. Jesus says, no, it's out of, it's not the bread. It's the obedience. It's that we would live on everything that comes from God. His words are our food, essentially, and God provides our needs, right? Second thing is this. He begins to take Jesus, and this is an interesting episode. So he takes him to the top of the temple complex, this massive temple, and he looks down and says, go ahead and throw yourself over. And then he quotes scripture, and Satan says, because his angels will protect you. Nothing's going to get harmed. You're going to be good. So why don't you just go ahead and do that? The second one is really all about power. And Jesus says this, do not put the Lord God, your God, to the test. Again, quoting back in Deuteronomy and saying when the people in Massah or when they went out and into the wilderness and there was no water for them to drink, the people put God to the test, the scripture says, and they began to cry out and begin to look and say, we don't have any water. Why didn't you just let us die back in Israel? What's the deal? God, you can't provide for us. You can't take care of us. And why don't you show us if you're going to say you're God that you really are God? They put him to the test, right? God is not one to be manipulated. And it is a reminder, and Jesus was making this illustration very clear, that this isn't our story, it's God's story. And Jesus, in perfect submission to the Father, said, no, I'm not here for me to put on some magic show for you. I'm here for the salvation of the world, and I will be perfectly obedient to the Father. And in the same way, we would say God is not here for our manipulation, but we are here for his story and his glory. So then the third temptation. Satan takes him, shows him all of the kingdoms of the world, and says all you have to do is bow down and all this can be yours. 
And for us to understand the depth of that temptation, imagine and put yourself in the mind of Christ and what you knew you were going to have to go through. You were going to have to go through the agony of separation from the Father. You were going to have to go through the excruciating pain and suffering of crucifixion on a cross. You were going to have to go through uh, your disciples turning their back on you and even denying you, the closest ones to you, walking away. You're going to have to go through all that. And in that moment, just all you have to do is bow down and you get all that. What does Jesus say? You shall worship the Lord your God alone. All of that, all of that, it's not worth it. And think about that in our context. Just take the shortcut. Just take the easy way. You can have all this if you would just not serve and worship this God. Does he really know what's best for you? Remember Eve in the garden? Is that what God really said? Isn't he really just trying to hide from you things? God's saying, no, his ways are right. His ways are good. His ways are better. If we would follow in obedience and wait upon the Lord and be renewed in his strength, then we will see that God's ways are right and it's for our good. And Jesus passes the test. And he does it by refuting with scripture every time. Provision, power, pride, other things, these schemes of the devil that we see so clearly. I might call some of these, and there are a few more just to talk about quickly. One would be spiritual unawareness. So a scheme of the devil in our day is spiritual unawareness. We talked about it a minute ago, essentially meaning that there is no spiritual world. There is nobody tempting you. There is nobody. It's just all this kind of made up stuff for religion's sake, right, to create this enemy and all of that. And you hear it time and time again, and it's spiritual unawareness in the Western world. It's probably one of the greatest things that get up us off of point in terms of our relationship because we never pray against the enemy and the strongholds that come against us. Second thing would be this, spiritual apathy or lethargy. So what does that mean? It means has there ever been a moment in your life when you say, you know what, I remember a time when I used to be so passionate for Christ. But then over time, you know, I still go to church, still kind of do these things, but really I stopped seeing my neighbors really as opportunities to share the gospel with. Life just filled up, you know, things just happened. And then down the road, all of a sudden, we find ourselves and we're just kind of playing a game. It's so prevalent in our culture. Spiritual apathy or lethargy. Third thing would be this, spiritual distraction. This is great in our culture, right? If the enemy can fill our lives with so much other stuff, then we will never have time to do anything that's kingdom impactful. And what I mean by that is this, this, and this is where it hurts. Students, if you went on the mission trip, you're kind of excused from this. What did I do this week that had eternal impact? What did we do this week that had eternal impact? Did we share the gospel? Did we begin even a gospel conversation? Did we build relationships with neighbors, coworkers who might lead to that? Did we serve others for the opportunity that we might have the opportunity to share the gospel down the road with that? Did we draw near to Christ in an abiding relationship so that we would be transformed? What did we do that had eternal impact? Did we take opportunity with our kids at home, with our grandkids if they were in town? What did we do for the kingdom? And it makes us realize how easy it is to fill our lives and become spiritually distracted. There's also fear and doubt because living out my faith will mean rejection in some sense. It may mean that I won't get that promotion at work because my boss doesn't see things the same way I do. It means that uh, what if people don't like me? What if there is rejection? What if my friends at school reject me? What all these things, the fear and the doubt that can creep in that the enemy plays on. And then there's sin, lust, pride, and by the way, that, that slope of sin is usually very gradual and easy, and that leads us into a place of spiritual apathy. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Screwtape Letters, put it this way. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, and without signposts. 
Sin attacks often subtly. And it's one simple compromise after another, after another, after another. And it leads us to a place where we never thought we'd go. There is a real enemy. There are real schemes against us. And we fight it. 2 Corinthians 10 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but have, we have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And really, that's the beginning of verse 13. There, we come back to that. It says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may, able, may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. So how do we stand firm? First and foremost, we look to Jesus. Hebrews 12, too, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We abide with Christ. We walk faithfully with him. We soak up the scriptures in our own life. We pray to him and pour out our heart to him. We abide and walk with him in such a way that our eyes are fixed on the founder and perfecter of our faith. It is the beginning of it. If you want to walk out of spiritual apathy, spend time with Jesus, and he will begin to pull you out of that and begin to give you gospel lenses to see the world in the way that he does that needs him. And you'll realize the job that you have and the school that you go to and the life that you live is for his glory, and he's given it to you as a gift to make an eternal impact for him. Every one of us. We look to Jesus. Second thing is this, we pray and we wield the scripture. So next week we'll learn that the scripture is the, word, is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And you get this imagery of the sword. Josh Connor next week is going to walk through uh, the armor of God specifically while we're in Israel. Um, but I want to share this story real quick because I love it that we pray, that we spend time on our knees and we wield the scripture. So the other day we were in our house and and we had this picture near the stairs in our house, and it's got this wood kind of frame on it. It's kind of this cool artsy thing, and it's got a cross, and the cross is made out of metal, right? So it kind of protrudes out a little bit, and it's got this ornate kind of metal look to it. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm kneeling down at the stairs, because uh, I often do that in a house, just kneel at the stairs. No, I was, I was tying Joel's shoe, right? So I'm kneeling down at the stairs, and Joel's sitting there. He's our eight-year-old, and he looks at that cross, because I'm doing all the work with his shoes at this point. And he says, Dad, you know what? The cross is kind of like a sword, like the top of a sword. And I'm like, yeah, it kind of is. I look at it, and it's got this ornate, kind of looks like a sword that's kind of face down. And, and so I'm thinking, well, that's cool. And, you know, my mind goes to that passage that the, the word of the Lord is sword of the Spirit, all that. So, and then he looks up as I'm continuing to tie his shoe, and he goes, and you know what, Dad? He said, it's like it's stuck in the ground because that's what you do when the battle's over. You stick your sword in the ground. And like, I, just profound, honest, it hit me. Going, that's exactly right, my eight-year-old son. <laughs> like, the battle's over. You know, when I see that cross, and think of it when you see the cross, you can think of that image. That no matter what the enemy looks at us and tells us we're not worthy, no matter what he tempts us with or tells us that, hey, this path is better, that there is power in Christ that has already overcome because our enemy is not God's equal. He is defeated. And when you see that cross, it is the battle that has been won. The sword is in the ground. He is a defeated foe who is scraping because he knows his end is near. And we walk in the strength of our God. We pray and we wield the scripture. We put on the full armor of God. And the last piece of it this morning, 1 Timothy 6, 11 and 12. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called 
and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses that we would fight the good fight of faith because there are so many fights that are temptations and even become schemes of the enemy to take us to, that we would fight the fight of politics, that we would fight the fight of social causes, that we would fight the fight of fame, that we would fight the fight of wealth and success, that we would fight to accomplish our bucket list. You know what's interesting about all those fights is they seem like fights that are worthwhile, and at the end, when you conquer them, they will leave you empty. There is one good fight, and that we would fight the good fight of the faith. And Paul puts it this way the second time he writes to Timothy at the end of his life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Do we love his appearing? fight the good fight of faith. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Would we be a church, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, in that place, in that time, that no matter how dark our culture may get, that we would stand firm in the strength of our God? Would you bow your heads with me? with your eyes closed and head bowed. In just a moment, as we do, we come to a time of response. I just encourage you just to hear from the Lord and respond however he may lead you. Maybe this morning you realize you don't know Christ. And that simple gospel message became so vibrant and clear in your mind. And you sense that tugging in your spirit to talk to somebody about it myself or other pastors will be here. We would love the opportunity to share with you more. You can have salvation today and know that your eternity is secure forever in Christ. The forgiveness of your sins. Or maybe you're just wrestling with something. Maybe it was about what we talked about this morning in those words or something else and you just want someone to pray with you. We're here for that as well. Just respond however God would lead. Father, we thank you for the truth of these words, we thank you that you are strong and mighty, that you are a God who battles for your glory and for your people. Thank you that you are a God who is a refuge and a shelter that we can run into, that you truly are God alone and that you are the God who saves. Thank you for defeating sin and death for giving us eternal life through Christ if we would but confess you as Savior and Lord. Father, may we be faithful to walk with you in your strength, courageous to stand firm. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing in response?